In this video, we're going to address terminations, you know, when and why you need them. Uh, you've seen me use little through ter terminators like this one here, uh, or an end line terminator like this one, or even a 50 ohm termination uh, built into the input of a scope. So the short answers of why you need terminators, or why you'd want to use them, is that terminations help to minimize signal reflections and the distortion that can occur along the transmission path or the transmission line. And all, you'd use them typically when the propagation delay down the transmission path, whether it's a piece of coax or it's a length of trace on a circuit board, when that trans propagation delay becomes a significant portion of the rise time or wavelength of an RF signal, typically greater than 10 or 20 percent or sometimes less than that. So uh, it'll be frequency dependent when you need them which is why you don't typically see terminators used for DC signals, but as the signal frequencies go up and the rise times go down, uh, the use of transmission lines and proper terminations becomes more and more important. In order to take a look at why, we need to take a look at some longer examples, uh, longer answers, and some examples. So let's go do that. Okay, so let's consider a simple example of sending you know, a digital signal or a rising edge down from a signal source down to a load. Now the propagation down that line is not going to happen instantaneously. There is a speed associated with it, which is really a function of the dielectric constant. Now this line that we're sending this down could be a trace on a circuit board, it could be a coaxial line, and there's always a return path down through ground. So what happens is when this signal starts rising up, okay, we're We've got a voltage source here going through some source impedance, because right, nothing's got a perfectly zero source impedance. And then as soon as the, the voltage starts rising up at the input of this line, a couple things are happening. We're going to start inducing a current going through that line and start raising the voltage on that line. But it doesn't uh, happen limitlessly. Uh, you have to think about this line, you can think about it as having you know, distributed inductance through that line. So as the current is going through, it's got to basically go through that inductor and also there's a distributed capacitance across that line okay you know from the capacitance from the signal line itself to ground or maybe from the center conductor of the coax to the shield so what's really happening is as we send this you know voltage transient through this line we're basically sending current in that's going through this inductor and charging the distributed capacitance as you go along and because the line ideally is fairly consistent in its physical dimensions, the distributed inductance is fairly constant across the length of the line, and the distributed capacitance is fairly constant along the line. So what that means is we're going to have a, a voltage and current wavefront, okay, a change in voltage is going to cause a change in current that's going to equal to some constant value as we go through this line. And that constant value is what we call Z0 or the impedance of the line. So if we have a 50 ohm transmission line, the instantaneous change in voltage over change in current is going to have a 50 ohm relationship. That's what we mean by a 50 ohm transmission line. If it's a 75 ohm line, then that voltage and current wavefront as it's going down the line will have that impedance. So what's interesting is what happens when we get to the end of the line. So if we've got this wavefront coming down here, that has got this relationship of say 50 ohms. When we get to the end of the line here, if the load doesn't present that same impedance, what will happen is there will be a step voltage change. So if we've got say this voltage and current wavefront that's coming down here with a 50 ohm relationship, and then this is a high impedance load, all of a sudden the voltage is going to jump up higher. When that voltage jumps up higher here, that's going to now induce a current flowing in the other direction and that's going to propagate in the other direction with that same voltage and current relationship. So at any point on the line we have these two voltages, the incident voltage coming in and the reflected voltage coming back adding up to create a voltage at different points on the line. So as this signal is propagating down and its reflection is coming back you'll get some distortion in the middle of the line. Uh, so in the case of say a digital signal you might be you know, sending a signal out here that is going out to maybe multiple loads connected up. So they might all see some distorted version of that waveform. So let's go take a look at that on the scope to see what we're talking about.
Okay, so what we've got set up here is a signal source generating a square wave, in this case at 10 megahertz. That's coming out through this piece of coax here. I've got it joined up into a T because uh, I'm going to look at the what's going on in the middle of the line here in a moment. And then the other end of that is going up into the scope. And right now I've got the scope terminated into 50 ohms, which is what that generator expects. And I can see a really nice clean version of that square wave on the scope screen. Now let's go take a look at what's going on in the middle of the line. If I connect that up here as well, turn on channel 2, I can see I've got a nice clean signal in the middle of the line as well. And if we look carefully, if I put a cursor up here, we can actually see you know, there, there is a propagation delay between the end of the line and the point that we're observing here. Like, let's zoom in on that and take a better look. Okay, so looking at this a little bit more closely on the scope, we can see up on top here, channel 1, is the signal that we're seeing at the very end of the 50 ohm transmission line, terminated into 50 ohms. And then on channel 2, down below here, we're looking at the signal kind of midway through the line. There's about 5 or 6 feet of coax on either side of this T. And that's terminated into a high impedance so that uh, we're just tapping off this line with a high impedance. It's not going to affect things too much. Now we can see there's about an 8.4 nanosecond or so delay from this point all the way down back through to the end. Now the signal, not only at the end of the line, but also in the middle of the line, looks really nice and clean. And that's because we're doing the proper thing with terminations. Our signal source has got a 50 ohm source impedance. We're going into a 50 ohm transmission line and we're terminating into 50 ohms. So uh, when we launch that signal in, we're getting essentially a 50% voltage divider between the source impedance from my signal generator and the 50 ohm line. Okay, and then the voltage and current going down the line has this 50 ohm relationship. It hits a 50 ohm load, gets properly terminated, there's no signal reflected back, and everything is nice and clean. And that's what we have on the scope. So let's take a look at what happens if we don't properly terminate the end of the line with the characteristic impedance of the line. Let's say we make it go to a high impedance, like 1 mega ohm. Now I see two things. One is that the signal level at the output, or the end of the line, is doubled in amplitude. We'll talk about why that is. And I also see some distortion occurring at our tap point in the middle of the line. So why are the, both of those things happening? Again, if we take a look at our quick little model here, we're using a signal source that has an output impedance of 50 ohms. So when we initially launch that uh, signal into the transmission line, the transmission line looks like a 50 ohm resistor. So we're going to get that voltage divider between the 50 ohm source impedance and the line itself. And that's going to propagate all the way down the line. And then when we get to the end of the line, instead of seeing 50 ohms, it sees a high impedance. So the voltage jumps up and then starts going back the other way and then those will add up to our tap point. So that's actually what's going on here. Uh, as we launch the signal into the line, eventually we're going to see it show up at our tap point right here. And it's going to show up at half the amplitude because that's the when the signal is just going down the line uh, on its way towards the end of the line. When the signal reaches the end of the line here, we're going to get a reflection coming back because we've got a high, higher impedance here than we have on the transmission line. That reflected energy coming back goes all the way back through and when it, add, when it passes by our tap point again, it adds up with the voltage that was there and creates our full amplitude and that goes all the way back. Then the same thing happens on the falling edge. Now of course, this could cause some real problems if we had a logic device sitting here trying to measure whether we were at a 1 or a 0 that distortion could certainly affect that and maybe create noise and chatter. So that's certainly one thing that can happen with not properly terminating a digital line or a digital bus. And oftentimes with digital signals the source impedance may not match the line impedance. So what would happen in that case, that reflected signal coming back wouldn't see 50 ohms looking into the source and another reflection would happen and it would go back this way and that process would continue back and forth until those reflections die out and what that would look like you know in the from a digital signal standpoint looks like ringing if you've ever seen ringing on a signal that looks like that oftentimes that ringing is due to these reflections bouncing back and forth between the source and the load so we took a look at some of the distortion that can happen on digital signals uh, along a transmission line if they're not properly terminated.
You can also have problems with RF signals. You know, think of an RF signal you know, as a sine wave at a higher frequency. Reflections from misterminated lines can also reflect back, so you essentially can have a wave traveling in this direction, another wave traveling in that direction. And what that'll ha what'll happen is, depending on your location along the line, the sum of the incident wave and reflected wave will either add constructively or destructively. So what that means is that you can have a signal amplitude that will vary depending on where you're looking at it along the transmission line. Or if the frequency is varying, you can get an amplitude that will vary as a function of frequency. The result of the summing of the incident wave and the reflected wave sets up something called a standing wave. And if you've ever been uh, maybe at the ocean and you've seen a wave slam into a bulkhead and then the, ref the wave gets reflected back, or maybe you're looking all over the side of a boat and you see a wave hit the side of the boat and go back, oftentimes you'll see those two waves overlapping and it results in the the surface of the water bouncing back and forth kind of like this but really not a wave traveling in one direction or the other. Uh, so that's the same property of standing waves. So maybe before going to the scope here's a, a quick way of looking at the reflection. I've got, got just a sheet of plastic here. As I move this across you can kind of see you know my regular signal and if you look carefully hopefully this picks up in the video we see a reflection that we're getting from the plastic. As we can see, as we move this back and forth, change our position on the line, we can actually see we get situations where that reflection will add up in phase with the existing signal, making it essentially twice as big or larger. Or if we move across, we might get to a situation where the reflection will add destructively or simply try to cancel out the signal going on. So depending on your physical location along the line, you can get this constructive or destructive addition of these two waveforms. Now it's not clear from this picture that you wind up setting up a standing wave. So let's take a look at that on the scope and we can see how the resulting sum will be a wave that is standing and just bouncing back and forth essentially in place. Okay, so I'm cheating here a little bit since I don't have a way of separating out the incident wave from the reflected wave. I'm actually just applying two signals at basically the same frequency here. So uh, we could see if these two signals are essentially in phase with each other, if we take the sum of them, add them together, we can see I get a signal that is uh, you know, basically in phase with them and added up. If I move th these two signals so it looks like one is the incident wave and one is the reflected wave, you'll be able to see how the sum is staying essentially in place with respect to the other two signals even though one is moving in this direction one is moving in that direction the sum is standing in place it's just changing in amplitude okay so let's set things in motion and we'll watch I'm going to simulate the incident wave moving in this direction the reflected wave moving in that direction and watch that the sum of them will change in amplitude but won't change in position horizontally see how that uh, that sum is kind of staying in one direction. Let's move it the other way. You can kind of see the we get a standing wave essentially of the sum between them even though the incident wave and reflected waves are moving in opposite directions. So that's what we mean by getting essentially a standing wave, uh, a standing wave pattern on the coax itself if you're not properly terminated because the reflected wave and the incident wave will add up but they're, because they're the same frequency, as they add up, they create this wave that stands in place but just changes in amplitude. So if you observe the signal at different points within the line, you're going to see a different amplitude. So let's uh, take a look at that another way. Okay, so I'm now back to the situation where I've got a sine wave going in through a piece of coax. I'm tapping halfway through that coax on channel 2 down here, and then the coax is finally running off to channel 1 and getting terminated into 50 ohms. If I go over and change the uh, frequency of my input signal, uh, we can see that the amplitude of the inputs, the signal at the termination and the amplitude in the middle of the line are basically the same. As I bring the frequency up or down, there's no problem. So a properly terminated RF transmission line is going to have a nice consistent RF amplitude across the line. Of course there'll be losses across the line, but you're not going to have any reflected energy that's going to affect the ability uh, for that signal to have the same amplitude as we go down the line.
Now if we improperly terminate the transmission line, we're going to get that reflection, we'll get those signals adding up. So let's go to the extreme case by uh, making the output, uh, the termination at the output, a high impedance. So now we're going to get a large signal reflection coming back. And now as I change frequency, we're going to effectively be changing our position along the line because relative to the phase of the signal, we're going to be looking at a different position within the line with respect to the phase of that signal. So as I bring the signal frequency up, you're going to see two things. You're going to see the output amplitude change, and you're also going to see the amplitude at the middle of the line change. So as I bring the signal up, notice how the, that, the voltage at the right at the tap point of the line here has almost gone away. At this frequency here, which is 33 megahertz, I've al almost completely lost the signal at that point in time. If I keep going, okay, so now I'm at uh, 45 megahertz, my signal's back again. If we keep going again, right, now my signal's actually grown even more, I'm at 68 megahertz there, and now my signal is dropping back off again, so right about, right about at 100 megahertz, I've almost lost the signal again. So depending on, you know, the frequency and essentially our position along the line with respect to phase of the signal is going to, we're going to see that effective change in amplitude at different points within the line. And that's a result of that standing wave. Now you've noticed as I ramp the frequency up, we reached a point where the signal basically went away. And uh, that's actually a, a pretty interesting point. Okay. At that point, um, the length of that stub that we've got between our tap point and the open circuit termination is equal to a quarter wavelength of the signal frequency. Uh, now it could be an odd quarter wavelength, but since we started at a low frequency and ramped up, uh, th this is now a quarter wavelength long. Now why does a quarter wavelength long that's open circuited at the end cause a short circuit to appear to make the signal go away? Well, if you think about a, a sine wave, um, if we've got a transmission line that's a quarter wavelength long, that's 90 degrees. So if we have a signal that goes out 90 degrees, gets reflected back, when it comes back, it's 180 degrees out of phase. Now 180 degrees out of phase is like inverting the signal. So if you add a signal and it's inverse, it cancels out. So a quarter wavelength transmission line has got a pretty unique property that if left open circuited, at the frequency where it's a quarter wavelength long, it'll look like a short circuit, even though it's an open circuit going in. So this is actually an interesting way of measuring the length of a piece of coax or a transmission line, as long as you know the uh, velocity factor associated with that line. So here's, a, in this particular case, we, we know we found that first null of the power going away uh, right at 33 megahertz. And we could run a pretty simple calculation. We say at 33 megahertz, the wavelength in free space is 300 divided by 33 megahertz, gives me 9.09 .09 meters. Now, in this coax, this RG58 coax has got a 66% velocity factor. So the wavelength in the coax is essentially equal to the free space wavelength multiplied by the velocity factor, or 6 meters. Now, for a quarter wavelength line, we just have to divide that by 4. So 6 meters divided by 4 gives me 1.5 meters. That's the length of the coax. Converted to feet, it's about 4.9 feet. So, uh, and that is indeed the length of the hunk of coax here. So, using that property, we're able to measure the length of that coax by just changing the frequency and looking for the lowest frequency that causes a null. And we know that's the quarter wavelength frequency, or the quarter wavelength of that line. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed uh, this video, learned a little something about terminations and why we use them, and the effects that you can have if you don't use them properly. Thanks again for watching.